Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Hebrews, the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is far more excellent than theirs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want you to be comfortable with Scripture. When you pick up the Bible and you read it, I want you to be confident that you understand it and confident that it is true. This is the goal of my preaching in general and of this series in particular. For the past two weeks, I have preached about why you should believe the Bible is the trustworthy, inspired Word of God. Over these next two sermons, I want to help you understand the Bible. If you're going to understand the Bible, there are two things especially you have to get your mind around. The first is the Bible tells one story. And the second, the Bible is about Jesus. The whole thing. Next week, I'm going to preach on the second one. The Bible is about Jesus. Today, I want to make sure that you understand the one story of the Bible. And by the way, when I say story, I don't mean something that's made up. I'm using that word the same way I would use it if I told you the story of how I met my wife. Some people hear that word story and they think something that's made up, like a fairy tale. But I actually did meet my wife, and there is a true story about how that happened. And likewise, the Bible is a true story. Actually, the Bible is a lot of different stories. It's 66 different books written by dozens of authors over a period of more than 1,200 years. And you say, how can all of that come together to make one story? Well, it does. In fact, it's a romance, the story of God's love for his people. It's the story of his plan of redemption. The story of how God created a good world, we ruined it through our sin, and God saves us and renews his creation. If you're going to understand the Bible and all of the little stories that are in it, you must have a good understanding of the big story. You have to understand the overall structure in order to recognize where all these little stories fit into it and how they fit together. And if you don't recognize the large structure of the Bible, then you're going to misunderstand the Bible and think that it's just a storybook like Aesop's Fables. I don't know if people still read Aesop's Fables. We did when I was a kid. I remember the story of the grasshopper and the ant. The ant worked really hard all summer to store up food for the winter. The grasshopper just played around. When winter came, the ant had food and the grasshopper didn't. The moral of the story was work hard. There was another one, the tortoise and the hare. Most people are familiar with this one. The tortoise was so confident that he could beat the hare in a race that he just goofed off. And the tortoise plodded along to victory. The moral of the story, slow and steady wins the race. You think about Aesop's fables, each one can stand alone and each one has a little moral. Some people think the Bible is like that, but it is not. Not at all. Each one of Aesop's fables stands alone. They're not organically connected. The stories in the Bible are organically connected. What makes the Bible difference is this this superstructure, this, this one story that ties everything together. So I'll give you an example. Think of David and Goliath. 
Some people think that's a story. And the moral of it is that we should be courageous and trust God. That is a small part of it. We should be men and women of faith, as David was a man of faith. But we read that story aware that God had made David king. And God made a covenant with David. God promised David that one of his descendants would rule over God's people forever. And we know Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant promise. So a better understanding of the David and Goliath incident is that God saves his people through his anointed king. Years ago, I taught a confirmation class. It was at a church that I, I served, and most of the kids had grown up in church. I wanted to find out how much they knew so I would know where to start. So I, I took a little deck of cards, index cards, and I wrote the names of Bible characters on each one. I had Moses and Abraham and Esther and Ruth and David and Jesus Simon, Peter, Paul, you know, all the, all the main characters in the Bible. And I held the cards up one by one, and I said, tell me what you know about this person. And they could tell me a lot about every one of the people that I held up. So it seemed that they really knew the Bible. Then I laid all the cards on the table, and I said, put these in chronological order. And they didn't have a clue. A lively debate broke out about whether Jesus came before or after Moses. Now, this was not a theological debate about the pre-existence of the Son of God. They just didn't know whether Jesus died on the cross before or after Moses told Pharaoh, let my people go. It was after. But you see the issue. And the problem here, if you don't know the outline of the Bible, if, if you don't know the one story that the Bible tells, then you're not going to know what to do with each one of those little stories. You're going to lose the plan of redemption, God's plan of salvation in Scripture, and all you're going to have is moralism, little stories that, that tell you to be honest or helpful or kind or whatever. This one story is so crucial. So what I want to do today is I want to walk you through this one story and kind of give you a broad outline of what it looks like. You should be aware that the Bible itself invites us to read it this way. This is not a structure we are imposing on the Bible. The Bible presents this story to us. I could have chosen as the scripture reading today one of the sermons in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7, for example, Stephen preaches and he tells this one story from Abraham all the way to Jesus. And he does this so that the people listening to him would know how Jesus fits into the story that they already knew and how they fit into the story. It's important that we recognize how this works and where we fit into it. Instead of one of these sermons from the book of Acts, though, I have chosen a little snapshot of the story that we find at the beginning of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews teaches that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is all about Jesus. The point of our particular scripture reading is that Jesus not only fulfills the promises and expectations of the Old Testament, but he exceeds them. The author of Hebrews, and by the way, we have no idea who wrote Hebrews, but whoever it was, that person had the same way of reading the Old Testament as the gospel writers and all the other New Testament writers. Anyway, the gospel, the, the writer of Hebrews started this way. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. 
Now, do you see here both the continuity and the discontinuity? It's continuity because the same God is speaking. The discontinuity comes because he's speaking in a new way, a clearer, more definitive way, speaking by his son. So this tells us something about the Bible. It holds together as one story because throughout the Bible, the same God is speaking. And the Bible tells the story of God's dealings with his creation from the start to the finish. That's what holds it together. What's really fascinating is that it gives us this from both God's perspective and ours. Remember last week when I explained that the Bible is both divine and human. It is both our record of God's mighty deeds and a God-breathed self-revelation from God himself. That's really, really wonderful. So, so God spoke first through the prophets in many times, in many ways, but now through his son. And this teaches us something else about the Bible, that Jesus is the center of it. He is the climax of the story. And, you know, we can plot the Bible this way. Did you ever plot stories when you were in English class? You remember that? You would start out with the initial tension, and then you'd have the rising action, and then there'd be the climax, and then the falling action, and then the resolution. And most stories can be plotted out this way. Well, we can plot the Bible that way. This week, my sermon really depends a lot on the graphics. I don't have an easy way to share them with you, so I have a really low-tech solution to a high-tech problem, and that is I just printed these out on pieces of paper. So let me hold this up for you. This is the plot line of the Bible, and you can see that it begins with the initial tension, which is sin. Very early in the Bible, we human beings rebelled against God, and the rest of the Bible is all about how God dealt with and overcame our sin. The rising action is Israel's story, starting from the call of Abraham and including the Exodus and the covenant of Sinai and the giving of the law and the kings and the prophets. The climax of the story is Jesus, especially his cross and resurrection. Here, the problem of sin was dealt with decisively. Then we have the falling action, literarily speaking, as the gospel spreads throughout the earth, and then at the end, there's new creation, and that is the resolution to the story. So we can plot the outline of the Bible that way and see that Jesus is the very center of it. That story is our scripture reading in a nutshell. It talks about how Jesus is the eternal Son of God through whom God created. You have creation. He made purification for sins. There's the climax of the story. He sat down at the right hand of God. That's the falling action moving toward resolution. At this point, you may have a skeptical kind of question. You may want to ask, isn't it odd that the Bible fits our standard mode of storytelling so well? Isn't that an indication that we have just imposed this on the Bible? That we forced the Bible into the straitjacket? I don't think so. I think instead, God is the original storyteller. God is the true storyteller who tells the story of history. And we learn from God how to tell stories. We imitate him. I think that's what's going on here. God tells the true story, the story we find in Scripture, and all our stories are imitations. So that's the plot. Now I want to walk you through an outline of the one story of the Bible. As we think about the drama of Scripture, we can think of it as a drama in six acts, or we can um, summarize the one story of the Bible under six headings. 
And I want to walk you through that because, again, once you have this story in your mind, then you not only see the big picture of the Bible, but you understand how all those little pictures, how all the individual stories fit together. So let's, let's take a look here. Uh, the six different headings we want to have here, the six acts, are these. God created. God called a people for himself. God judged and redeemed a nation. God sent the Savior. God empowers his church. And God will make all things new. Let me walk you through this. So we start with God created. Now, this is going to be in Genesis 1 through 11, right at the beginning of the Bible. It tells us how God created. And he created the world, and he looked and he saw that it was very good. Now, the last time you looked at the world around you or you looked at your own life, was it all very good? Kind of yes, kind of no, right? And the world is full of beauty and goodness, and yet there's also pain and evil. The Bible says God intends the good, but not the evil. Something has gone wrong. And you don't have to read very far into the Bible until you find out what it is, because in Genesis chapter 3, we are told how the first man and first woman willfully and knowingly disobeyed God. And this brought sin into the world, and we have been dishonoring and disobeying God ever since. Now, in this graphic, you can see the earth to remind you that God created the heavens and the earth, and you see an apple here to remind you that Adam and Eve ate the fruit. The Bible doesn't say it was an apple. The Bible doesn't say what kind of fruit it was, but I had to put some kind of fruit in the picture, so we have an apple. We see the initial tension starting because God creates a good world. Through our sin, we human beings, beings ruin it. We're responsible for the mess and the problem that this caused. And God could have said, and God wiped out those ungrateful wretches and he lived happily ever after the end. And then the Bible would have been three pages long. But God didn't do that. And the rest of the Bible tells how God acted to save us and set creation right. Number two, God called a people for himself. God's plan of salvation began with one man, Abraham. God chose Abraham, and he chose him for a very important reason, Sheer grace. And then God called him. And over and over in the Bible, we see this happening. God chooses someone out of sheer grace and then calls that person. As so we read the rest of the book of Genesis about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their wives and children, you might think, what was God thinking? calling this group, they are a mess. Well, just wait till you see the group he calls in the New Testament, or even today. God made a covenant with Abraham and promised Abraham that he would make Abraham into a great nation. And over and over, it looked as if that promise was threatened, as if it were doomed, but God did it. And you see Abraham's family tree here. God did make Abraham a large family, and the family moved to Egypt, and there they became a great nation. But they were enslaved until God raised up Moses to rescue them and lead them out of Egypt into freedom in the promised land. And along the way, they stopped at Mount Sinai, where God made a covenant with them and gave them the Ten Commandments. You see here the pyramids and the Ten Commandments to remind you of this part of the story. The second act, God called the people for himself, can be found in Genesis chapter 12, all the way through the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Number three, God judged and redeemed a nation. 
Actually, God did this over and over again. Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land and settled them there. They were supposed to be God's people, and that meant they were not supposed to worship any other gods, and they were not supposed to do all the wicked things that the nations around them were doing. But they struggled with this. And for a while, they would honor God. Within the next generation or the generation after that would forget God. And so they would start to do the things the other nations were doing, and pretty soon they would be as bad or worse than all the pagans. And God would allow them to be oppressed. And they would cry out to God, and God would raise up a deliverer to free them. And then for a while they would honor God, and then the cycle would start again and again. And this happened throughout the Old Testament. At one point, they asked God for a king. First, God gave them exactly the king that they wanted. That was King Saul, and that didn't work out so well. So God gave them the king God wanted, and that was David. God made a covenant with David and promised him that one of David's descendants would rule God's people forever. After David's son Solomon died, the kingdom split into two parts, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. After this, there were some good kings, but mostly bad. This is the time when God raised up the prophets. This is the time when the Psalms were sung in the temple. And you see here in the graphic three things. You have a map of the Holy Land uh, when the, the 12 tribes settled there. You have a crown and a cutaway view of the temple. This is because during this time, God gave his people three tangible expressions of his presence and his grace. The land, the king, and the temple. A key event that happened in the Old Testament was when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took the people into captivity. God's people had been relentlessly idolatrous, persistently idolatrous, until God finally brought judgment. The Babylonians came, and they destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, took the king, took most of the people away into captivity. So they lost the land, the king, and the temple, everything that had connected them to God. And yet God is gracious and full of steadfast love, and so he brought them back. And they rebuilt the temple, but the king was not restored. And yet they never lost hope that God would restore David's dynasty. And for hundreds of years, they hoped and they trusted and they waited that God would raise up an anointed king. In Hebrew, a Messiah. And he did. Number four, God sent the Savior. God did send the Messiah. He sent Jesus. And Jesus was not just an earthly king who came to set up an earthly kingdom. He is the eternal son of God who came to deal with the problem of sin once and for all. To deal with that deepest of problems. To reconcile us to God and to make all things new. The story of Jesus is full of surprises. He was born into a poor family in humble circumstances. He grew up in Galilee. He began to teach about the kingdom of God and to perform signs and wonders. He healed people and he drove out demons. The nation was captivated by him and deeply divided. Some people thought that Jesus was a prophet. Others considered him the Messiah. And still others thought he was a dangerous deceiver. The religious leaders in Jerusalem especially had no use for Jesus and they conspired against him to kill him. They handed him over to the Romans who murdered him on a cross. And yet the Bible insists, because Jesus himself insisted, that this had to happen because it was God's plan. The cross was not an accident or a tragedy. Rather, Jesus gave himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, God himself bore our sins on the cross and died in our place so that we could be reconciled to him and he could 
Be just and yet forgive us. Perhaps the most surprising thing about Jesus' story is that it, he rose again on the third day. He rose bodily from the dead, and 40 days later he ascended into heaven, and he rules and intercedes for his people. And yet, neither the Bible nor the story of Jesus ends here. The story of Jesus is told mostly in the four Gospels, and yet there is more. Because, number five, God empowers his church. Notice the change in verb tense from past to present. In the first four acts, those are things God has already done. But I use the present tense here because God is still empowering his church. The Bible starts with creation. It ends with new creation. Obviously, we live in between those things. I like to say that we are not in the Bible, but we are part of the story the Bible tells. And it is crucial that you understand that because you're not going to understand the Bible or how it applies to your life until you recognize that we are a part of that story. You see here uh, a picture of Pentecost. Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit to create his church and empower it to share his story throughout the whole world. And that's been happening ever since. You see a boat here to represent the missionary zeal of the apostles who went around telling the good news and starting churches. You see a man here, I think this is supposed to be Paul, holding a letter. Most of the New Testament writings are letters written to individuals or to churches. So God empowers his church, and he started this mission. Jesus told his disciples to go into all the earth and make disciples, and he gave them his Holy Spirit to make that happen, and it's still going on. So you also see our church, and that shouldn't surprise you because, again, we're not in the Bible, but we are part of the story it tells. This is still unfolding. We're part of the story. Bible is our story. What Adam and Eve did affects us. Their sin affects us. We are children of Abraham, spiritually his children, if we have the kind of faith that he had. We are a part of God's covenant people if by faith and baptism we are united with Jesus Christ. And we have the same mission Jesus gave to his disciples to go and tell the world and to make his story known. God empowered his church. He empowers us still. It's our story and we are a part of it. And finally, six, someday God will make all things new. Again, we have a verb tense, into the future. Because this is something that has not happened yet. God is going to make all things new. God isn't finished. Not until evil is eliminated and all sorrow is no more. Death is no more. That is what God has promised. Christians have several different ways to interpret what the Bible says about the last days. But all Christians agree that someday, Christ will return. And someday God's kingdom will be established in the fullness of its glory. And someday, as the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible puts it, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So that is the story of the Bible. From creation to new creation. If you understand that story and you have that outline in your head, you will understand the Bible so much better. It is 
our story. It is about us. We are a part of what God is doing. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, then you know how the story ends. And you can be confident that you will share his eternal glory. And even death cannot take that away from you. Amen.